Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Brew. This is your host, Bill Brewster. I want to prepare you for what you're about to hear on this episode. I recorded this episode with Mike, also known as Non-Gap, at N-O-N-G-A-A-P. He runs the Non-Gap Substack. The audio was corrupted. His side of the audio picked up some of my audio, so there's going to be certain parts of this podcast that sound like my voice is a little bit different. I subsequently recorded a one-way conversation with myself reading off a transcript and listening to him. Matthew Passy at M-A-T-H-E-W-P-A-S-S-Y on Twitter is my podcast producer, and he also runs a podcast consultancy. You can find him at auditmypodcast.com or podcastmeanything.com. Matthew and his team stitched this thing together. I thought that the episode was completely lost, and they did a fantastic job at salvaging this conversation, and I think that what we're going to deliver to all y'all is a pretty good representation of the conversation that actually happened, and I'm just so grateful to Matthew and his team for putting in all the time. I know that I can be super anal and a pain in the ass as a client sometimes, and they have done everything that I've ever asked them to, and I just really appreciate them coming together to save this episode. So I hope you all enjoy what you're about to hear, and thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. I got Mike Nongap with me, the master of the dark arts of corporate governance. Mike's doing some really cool stuff out there if you don't know about him. He uh, runs the Nongap, N-O-N-G-A-A-P, Substack. He goes by at Nongap on Twitter, and he's just doing some really cool stuff, looking at the world from a different lens. So check him out if you like what you hear today. None of this is investment advice. We're not your financial advisors. We're not your fiduciaries. You know the deal. This is all for entertainment purposes only. Do your own due diligence. So Mike, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm good. I recently resubbed to you because I got that Regeneron write-up that you did. And I, I admit this the, your Substack sort of fell out of my process a little bit, and when I read it, I thought to myself, "How is this not still part of my process? This is insane that I'm not looking at stuff like this." I apologize for falling off the Substack, but I'm fully back on. Oh no, not not a problem. Are you actually in Regeneron before you saw the write up? No, I'm not. I just found it very interesting. I would say that as far as what I write, like a lot of the super value ad tends to be tied to folks that have been following, you know, a name or an investment for a long time and and I'll just get like an inbound go, "Hey, what's this filing all about?" and then I'll take a look at it, throw in some hot takes and they kind of backfill the actual fundamentals for me, which is appreciated and then we're able to kind of, you know, build a pretty differentiated uh, picture of what may be going on. Now, we can't always be correct, but it's definitely a, a fun way of, of of looking at investing and at decision making for sure. So if people are not familiar with what you're doing, how would you lay it out as to sort of how you view proxy filings and incentives and whatnot? So I would, I would keep it really simple. I think for all of us, right, as investors, regardless of, you know, kind of how we label or brand ourselves, whether it's corporate governance or value or growth or anything of the sort, our game is we're trying to forecast valuations and make investments where we think there's some ideally risk-adjusted return between what we think is going to happen to the price and what the price currently is, right? And I think for most investors, how they approach forecasting values is, I mean, what is it? You're you're forecasting financials, you're you're doing qualitative research around moats and quarter five forces and customers and things like that. But I kind of take it even more high level than just forecasting financials. I, I think what I'm trying to do is try to understand and you know, may, maybe this isn't the right way of thinking about it, but you know, we're kind of building this on the fly. I, I just try to forecast decisions, right? And the reason I do it that way is if you kind of understand what the decisions are, that drives you know the incremental capital allocation and operational decisions, 
which in turn drive financial forecasting, which drives evaluation. So if you actually can figure out what the management team is doing ahead of time, that window tends to be an opportunity to get into a stock or out of a stock before others kind of figure it out. So, you know, when I think about proxies and corporate governance and and things like that, really what I'm trying to do is one of two things. Can I forecast what the incremental decision is that's going to happen here as far as like driving, you know, valuation or Can I just skip that step? And are they signaling or forecasting their view on valuation? Because if I can just not even have to think about how it ties into the the financials and driving that value, and I can just rely on how I think the management team is thinking uh, about valuation, I'll just do that, right? It's like a game of poker. Like if you're sitting on pocket aces and and you're showing all the signs of of being very excitable and greedy and, and, and things like that. I can't guarantee that you have pocket aces, but I've played this game enough times where I'm like, you know what? This is kind of the telltale signs of this. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I may not know what you got, but you got something good. Exactly. And so that's why I started the Dark Art series is, is around that concept. Now, the reason I kind of look at things this way is I would say almost by accident. And, and the reason I say by accident is so before this whole newsletter and, and everything else, I did spend about a decade doing activist investing at this fund out in San Diego called Relational Investors. Very friendly activist investing. I think it's one of the few funds that Marty Lipton, who's you know very pro corporate, pro management, he's very complimentary of our process. So you know, we work behind the scenes. We engage with management teams and boards to effectively try to drive decisions that we think will drive the you know, long term value of the company or if there's a discount to value to help close that you know, discount to intrinsic value that we think the company is worth. So what do we mean by driving decisions? When you're on the board or you're working with board members, there are only so many levers that you can use at the top of an organization to try to drive the changes that you're hoping to see. And one of the most common and notable levers is around compensation, right? Compensation metrics, the whole Munger, you know, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome approach. So if we feel like we can set certain metrics or I call them guardrails because you still want to give some flexibility and runway for the management team to do what they got to do. If you set appropriate guardrails, that usually sets into motion the appropriate processes and procedures from the top all the way down that hopefully drive the decisions that you think will drive the proper whatever financial outcomes that you're hoping to drive, which in turn drives your, your valuation. So this is something I've done for a long time from a, you know, proactively trying to nudge decisions. And, and those decisions tend to get expressed in proxies. And so when, when I left the business of buy side and activist investing, obviously, you know, it's not like you can take those skills and, and just be an activist investor after you leave. So <laughs> I went from you know, investing from a perspective of driving outcomes to, well, can I actually visualize them? Can I actually like see it? I mean, I've, I've literally gone through the steps personally as a professional from point A to Z. Like, well, what if I just started from point Z of some of these situations, start looking at proxies and see if, if I can kind of back into what was the thinking that led to this, to this disclosure? Mm-hmm. And I think what I found, and, and it shouldn't be too surprising, is you know, a lot of the processes don't necessarily change company to company. So you can actually, maybe it's reading the tea leaves, sometimes it feels like that way, but remarkably, you actually are able to see situations where, oh, wow, okay, there's a turnaround or there's a sell-off. You know intuitively that the management team and the board are going to be, you know, very focused on trying to fix that, right? And whether it's their their economic interests or it's a company they care deeply about, they want to fix and right the ship. How do you do that? How do you express that in governance? That's kind of my sandbox. That's what gets me really excited to really dig in, right? This isn't just like 52-week low screen, oh, the stock is cheap. Yeah, you know, you normalize revenues and, and the margins, put a multiple on it, there's your upside. Like, that could work, but you also get into a lot of like, you know, dead value and value trap situations. I'm more than happy to take those same situations and go, well, the stock's blown up. If I'm on the board, what would be my response? How would I think about this? How should we rally the team? You know, and, and how does that get disclosed in, in the proxy and the governance docs? Is everyone underwater? 
do we need to like reset compensation to make sure everyone's properly aligned? That's like you're running governance the right way approach. The other approach is things blow up or or things are uh, about to get good. How do I load up on equity and, and, and compensation to really maximize my personal upside as a manager or something else? Or the market's not really understanding the inflection that's about to hit this industry or this company. All right, well, if you guys don't care, then you know we want to load up on the upside before you figure it out. So it, it definitely becomes kind of this game within the game to a certain extent. Hmm. I think for most people, when they look at proxies and corporate governance, they kind of gloss over this part of the, the research stack because it does really feel boring. It really does like, okay, yeah, salary, compensation, options. Like, mm -hmm. But when you actually kind of think through what drives those disclosures, what are, what are the processes in place that drive you know, how much to pay the guy or girl or you know, what's the mix of, of equity or you know, wh why should we pay equity in lieu of cash? Like, there, there's some very interesting dynamics and, and, I mean, arguably games going on around that. Do you have like a general framework that you're looking for? Are you looking to apply something to each specific situation? I think what you're looking to do is say, this is what I would do if I was running this. And you're looking for the people in place to do something similar. Similar Is that accurate? I don't know if I have like a specific framework, but I do believe in the whole notion of you got to stick to your process, right? And you got to stick to what you think works, what you think drives value within the names that, that you look at. Certainly when, when I look at a situation, there are certain levers that I'm potentially looking for, uh, especially on the tech side. So, you know, obviously I, back when I was at Relational, I covered tech, notably like software and kind of you know, network effect, marketplaces type situations. So from just a fundamental investor perspective, that absolutely you know, drives how I look at governance, right? And, and what I think may be appropriate actions. Do you mind real quick? Yeah. Do you mind expanding on what's unique about that set of companies and those compensation schemes that you're looking for, for tech and marketplace and things like that? So I love tech. I mean, I love software. I, maybe I don't like share that much. I probably don't really write as much about that side of things. It's cliched, but I, there is something about just having that whole you know notion of software eating the world and, and that thesis has seemed to play out for, for quite some time. So when Microsoft got its new CEO, Satya. They asked him, so what is kind of your M&A strategy for Microsoft going forward? And I think it, you know, one of his first big acquisitions was Minecraft, right? Which <laughs> when you, know, you kind of take the time machine <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and, and think about Microsoft at that moment in time. And that's your first kind of major acquisition as a new CEO. It was like very surprising in a good way for me. And outside the box. Yeah. Outside the box. And, and the way they kind of described it is, we're looking for communities. We're looking for networked assets, and that kind of you know resonated in the sense that wow, they just, like Microsoft just kind of clarified how I looked at tech and why I like tech, and it was here are these communities of, of passionate users around certain niches and and activities, and the internet and technologies allowed them to all connect with each other and build these interesting things, and that whole notion of using uh, software and technology to you know bring these groups together was a very awesome experience. I remember the first time I got my modem dial up when I was a kid and being able to connect to folks. I mean, it was some corners of the internet at the time was a little insane. I'll acknowledge that, but it was cool to meet you know, like-minded people. Still is. Still is. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess that's FinTwit in, in a nutshell. You definitely find your niches. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely find your niches out there. I think that's where, so I started investing kind of in the traditional deep value uh, model, small cap deep value, like very, very like gram and net nets out here in Pasadena at a, at a fund called First Wilshire Securities, who was basically the, the first fund that actually gave me a shot because I, I came from more of a nonprofit background. So I'll, I'll forever be grateful for them. Would you shot. do a nonprofit? So I, I graduated SC in you know, my first year or so. I was really passionate about social enterprising and using kind of sustainable business models to not only drive cash flows, but then use those cash flows to contribute towards certain missions, right? Nonprofit missions. It, it, it's just kind of funny with the ESG movement. I've, I feel like I've, 
uh, I've, I've come full circle. <laughs> with, with, I was going to say you're like the OG of ESG. I know, I know. It, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's funny. I worked at this little operation out here in L.A., that they were trying to build businesses around like training like youth and giving them jobs for job training and to kind of build you know certain life skills in the process right and obviously we had a, like a coffee roaster so we'd roast coffee that was supposed to be a combination of like building skills but also like using those proceeds to to fund the mission and and, and to fund other like organizations that that worked with us i mean super cool but the biggest takeaway so that, would the kids actually come in and roast the coffee and sell it and like work in the roastery so we never got that big for that particular business a lot oftentimes it was just me roasting coffee okay. <laughs> that business was a two-step where we were going to do job training but we had to get the business again sustainable business first so we had to get the business cash flowing which hmm. meant we had to work with vendors i mean it was it was hard work the biggest takeaway i can say from that whole experience is you have to have like a great franchise to support the mission and if you don't like it's very very difficult. So, you know, unless you're kind of the Starbucks of the world and you're driving appropriate ROICs and, and return on um, capital and all the moats and everything else that, that you have, it's, it's very hard to do anything more than that. But if you get that escape velocity, you are presented with a wonderful opportunity to not only, you know, drive meaningful change, but it's kind of this, I swore I'd, I wouldn't say flywheel, but here I am about to say flywheel, <laughs> where it's like, you're, you're, you're profitable. <laughs> but it's they like, are. They are. but I, like when I, when I see ESG and the ESG trend, I actually see, I know it's easy to be pessimistic about the category and just what it's about, but like, maybe it's because where I came from and, and how I look at things, I'm really optimistic about it. There's actually some really wonderful opportunities to use that platform to drive some really wonderful outcomes. Now, will the industry be able to do that? Is the industry even motivated to do that? I don't know. Hard to say. But personally, like, no. I, I get it. What I think what's hard to say is it's very hard to look at the idea of ESG and say that's not, you know, a good thing for society, right? Like if ESG does win and it incentivizes capital allocation in areas that are truly bettering the world, like who really cares if it outperforms? Because the externalities could be so huge that we'll all benefit. Now that said, if you're hiring a manager and they're saying I'm going to outperform because of ESG, you know, then you care a lot if they outperform, right? Where I have some issue with ESG is you look at what some ESG funds hold and you're like, there's no way this thing is ESG. That's just the financial industry taking marketing too far, but that's not necessarily a new story. That is clearly a criticism that I, I share as well. And, and frankly, like ESG, you shouldn't have to carve out, right? Like the best companies, the best operators in the world are, you know, partly informed by stakeholders. Because they understand longer term, mm -hmm. if, if you're going to drive value, you have to mm -hmm. you know, consider everyone involved. I think I've shared this story in the past, but Ralph Whitworth, who was one of the founding partners of Relational Investors, one of our big things was director diversity. And, and this was even before it was, I think, really this popular, dare say, checklist concept that a lot of companies follow. And, and our view was... Let's look at board composition from the perspective of, and, and this is how most boards kind of think about director secession and planning. They think of it as one director at a time. They, they almost think like, well, we have a seat to fill. What, what is kind of the one thing we need to address here? And then they try to find that exact thing. And if you actually took a step back, what you really need to do is go, what are kind of the big priorities of our organization that we need to address over the next three to five years? and then think, what are the holes there? What you end up recognizing or seeing is you actually don't have one seat you need to fill. You might actually need three to four seats. And those three to four seats naturally will have a very diverse set of perspectives and backgrounds. And really what it was, was our argument, if your process is really good, you don't even have to think from this ESG checkbox approach. Like you will naturally start filling out your, your roster of directors in the ways that people want you to fill it out, right? Something as simple as, well, let's eliminate 
the need, and they're not going to say that publicly, but you know, a lot of companies like to bring on ex-CEOs, right? Or they want to bring on someone with public board experience. Well, let's, you know, let's eliminate that. Let's, let's just actually strike that out. It immediately opens up your pool of candidates <laughs> by orders of magnitude. If you're limited to like who used to serve on a public board and who used to be a public company CEO, your Rolodex is quite tiny. And more often than not, that Rolodex basically becomes whoever the CEO wants to put on there. And, and that's oftentimes not you know, the right kind of thinking that you should have. I always joke that like, if you want to be on a board of a public company, you have one of two options. You either need to be 55, 60 years old executive of some public company, or you need to be a 30 year old private equity or venture capital professional, right? Those are literally like the, the, the two pools of, of people that get onto boards now. It's like you're, you're either college buds with the founder or you've done the networking circuit and, and everything else throughout your career. And like there's this huge pool of really talented people in the middle that you could really help drive a lot of value here and, and, and bring interesting perspectives to the board level. But yeah, I get it. You know, the process. And to your here. point, like relevant experience. So. It's one thing for a board to say, I don't want to take a huge risk that could backfire. So I'm going to choose from a group of candidates that's relatively safe. But I think there's far more upside in saying, let's throw out sort of the resume constraints around what may look correct. And instead, let's find the right person. So if you can be the type of activist that can go in and say, who cares what the paper resume is? It's all about finding the right people for this organization. I think you can probably unlock a lot of value if you can unlock that that sort of thought process. Oh, it's it's magical, right? Like I actually, you know, this is a very subtle piece of research. Like I'll pay attention to that. I'll see who have you brought on, who's leaving, like what, what are the relationships, where are the connections? Because at the end of the day, what is the biggest bottleneck or what's the friction? of opening things up to try to find the best person. Normally it's something around power and control, right? The CEO or you know, someone else wants to maintain a certain amount of control in the board. And so you know, they, they'll use certain processes and, and decisions to try to you know, ensure that controls. I mean, this gets into kind of the you know, newsletter tactics, but like you find a situation where say a company like the stock blows up and out of the blue, the CEO gets a massive grant of options off cycle. Just, you know, like this is very, what is going on here? And, and it's very abrupt and, and quick. Well, when you kind of take a step back and think, well, how is that possible? More often than not, you, you start digging in. It's like, oh, there's only two members on the comp committee. That means they can like, you know, be very nimble. Hmm. Oh, the chair of the comp committee has been around for decades. So clearly he has um, a very close relationship with the CEO. And then you start hmm. building this narrative of story where it's like, Clearly, someone wanted to get paid and they could pull it off and, and they had kind of the, the seats of power to make it happen very quickly. And they were able to push it through and do this off cycle grant because, you know, the board was tightly controlled and you didn't have that diversity of perspective or, or that perspective from someone that went, wait a minute, does this make sense? Why should we do it this way? Why can't we wait? We understand the need to get paid, but are there other avenues we, we can take? So you can actually see the difference between a highly an entrenched board right you can actually see how their decisions you know can be <laughs> i mean some companies are they're all over the place with with how they do stuff but you can literally see the difference between what i would consider a well-run board and one that will will flail around and, and kind of you know do things that clearly are in the interest of those inside the organization so going to that to your point yes i think opening it up will drive wonderful long-term value but there you know there is kind of an agency cost to a certain extent and and you know power politics at play that that make it difficult and you know hopefully whether it's an activist or this whole esg trend that will hopefully facilitate more openness but you know we'll see how that all plays out for sure so as someone that likes tech and corporate governance how do you feel about some of these dual class structures some of these guys have complete control over what's going on at their company. You know, what's funny is I come from the camp that if you're one of the top operators and thinkers in your space, you already have control. You don't need dual class control to run the organization. 
per se. Now, I, I get you know a lot of people will, will disagree, or maybe not a lot. A, a few people will disagree, but I'm probably going to sound a little bit cynical here. But it, it almost feels like the the concept of dual class control initially had its roots around protecting the founder from not from public investors, but from VCs to a certain extent, right? And, and keeping keeping their seat at the table to a certain extent and getting them replaced with, you know, quote unquote, adult supervision or professional management. And somehow that evolved from protecting founders from from the VCs to protecting them from, from these big evil activist funds and, and corporate vultures, which, I mean, objectively speaking, the number of funds in the marketplace that can do what what folks think public investors can do is quite small, hmm. right? Like yeah. hmm. it's almost comical the amount of protections that these founders have been afforded with this this sort of dual class voting structure in the name of shielding themselves from who? Carl Icahn, which you know, the you still need to build a coalition of, of other investors to to drive this change, right? Or or Elliot, like there aren't that many funds that are the boogeyman to really justify this the structure and then you start well you know, maybe i'm being cynical but now it's now it's kind of franchise considerations where yeah we're going public and to be founder friendly we're going to give you dual class control because we're deep in the money and we're about to exit like what's it to us you know to give dual class power hmm. um yeah like i always say you know what i would happily give dual class power to my ceo if i was deep in the money and had liquidation preference and a board seat yeah, certainly, right? Like, here's your control. Yeah, like, <laughs> right? I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not at risk. I personally think uh, you don't need it if you're doing things well. But you know, we got, we got to work in reality, right? As investors. So, as an investor, within the context of dual class control, when when it become more of a you know, ubiquitous concept, and and you can already see some of the pushback, right? With the indexes, I think. Uh, saying we're not going to consider like new dual class listings in, in our index. And like you have to put in sunset provisions, you know, so at some point it's no longer dual class. That's great. Like, I actually think that's the right compromise, right? Like, okay, you want to be newly public. There's a whole life cycle that all newly public companies tend to go through. Yeah, go ahead. We'll, we'll give you 10 years. And after 10 years, like it is what it is, right? Everyone gets one-to-one -one voting and, and we'll, we'll sort it out from there. No, that makes a lot of sense how you said that. Do you think, to your point, I mean, you mentioned that the indexes are driving some of this change and that it's also a pretty good compromise. Do you think that the services that are advising the indexes are doing a solid job overall, or are they just checking the box? My perception is that they're saying yes, but maybe I'm wrong. I think there's obviously a lot of controversy and, and friction around like what the indexes do from a proxy voting perspective, as well as what the proxy advisors are advising. And my takeaway is, you know, they serve a specific role in the marketplace. All things considered, they, they're doing as, uh, as good of a job as, as you can ask as far as literally being in charge of monitoring all these different, you know, proxy filings and, and compensation schemes and having basically a view on, every, on everything, right? where they fall short and it's not their fault is they they have a tough time around nuance especially around things that require a certain level of investor perspective to really come up with the right solution and and this is where you know a lot of funds tend to outsource all their thinking to the proxy advisors when you know that investor perspective that they need to fill in you know the, the holes that's their job that's not the role of the indexes and the advisors. And what ends up happening is those problems tend to build over time to the point where it blows up and requires an activist to kind of clean up and actually highlight why they're issues. And then, then those issues get kicked upstairs at these advisors and they go, oh yeah, that's not good. <laughs> we, we support the activist slate. Yeah. But it doesn't get to that point until all this kind of you know, in, in software, there's technical debt, there's governance debt, right, that builds and then eventually, you know, can can blow up. And, you know, I I talked about this with some companies like CoreLogic where, hey, their, their compensation structure kind of incentivizes the behaviors that now have this hostile takeover activist situation with Bill Foley that, you know, turned into them now running a process. 
it was like, you know, if, if any of the shareholders or, or advisory firms just kind of recognize that in, as far as like the metrics and the hurdles they were using, maybe we could have fixed this problem, you know, years ago. I don't know. But we definitely now have an environment where a lot of the problems in governance are due to issues that could have been addressed proactively if, if an investor you know, caught on. But instead, it built up over years and kind of blows up like like a volcano. So this is this is going back to the notion of dual class control in tech. Now we have kind of you know technical debt, governance debt. It's like a volcano. Like what are some decisions that may blow up in the founders of the company's face that now we have to address collectively, regardless of who has voting control? It was funny when when dual class became a thing. I was like, just because you have dual class control doesn't mean you have unilateral control. There, there are actually a lot of levers you can do to influence outcomes and, and to drive decisions at these organizations, even when you don't have the threat of a board seat. That's one. Two, if you are allowed to do what you want to do, even within a dual class situation, you get into now the game of like stakeholder capitalism, politics. I'm like, OK, you can ignore certain things if you're, you're running it as a founder you know, with your vision. But you ignore this thing, eventually you're not going to deal with me, Joe Investor. You're going to start dealing with Jim Politician that now is using you as a, as a political talking point to elevate their own career, right? Like the yeah. game of governance and, and all that, power and all that, it, it, it elevates. So like, you know, when, when, you took, when you took some voice away from the shareholders, I was like, okay, that's fine. But if you keep doing certain things, it's not the shareholder that's showing up. It's you know, the politician. And would you rather deal with the shareholder? Or, or a politician. I think shareholders are a little bit more reasonable, but but that's just me. Yeah, yeah, and more likely to actually get something done. So the first thing that you had said is that there are things that you can do. I think mo- when most people think of like organizations and governance systems, they think about, and this is a topic I actually haven't really talked about, uh, probably, for, <laughs> probably for a good reason, so I don't get in trouble. What can organizations do to set up the right system? Like what are what are some of the basic things that people should think about? People, when when thinking about governance, you think about just literally the explicit like organizational governance, right? The documents, articles, incorporation, bylaws. Companies have multiple governance systems in place, right? The culture itself is its own governance organ, and will often even you know, reject decisions that you know, a company makes if they feel like it violates kind of the the core values of of the culture and the roots of of the business. It's actually a very fascinating thing to actually witness. And I would actually say a lot of the, without getting too much into it, a a lot of our friendly activism or my experience in friendly activism at, at Relational was really just trying to realign corporate governance with the governance values of the culture of, of what they thought was important, which was usually, you know, a focus on, on the customer, a focus on, stakeholders and employees and, and using those values to ultimately drive long-term stock value. We're getting very qualitative, very sky in the pie type thinking, but there's, I can't even begin to describe like the excitement of showing up as an investor where there's certain notions when an activist shows up and some of them are, are well-earned. The best engagements are the ones where everyone, as far as the employee and, and the team feels like, oh, wow, we're getting back to our roots. We're, we're trying to get back to how we should be doing things. You're not going to agree with everything that we may advocate for, but just trying to get that true like cultural organizational alignment is, is a big deal. So to your question about like there are different levers to influence change, simply appealing to the cultural core values of an organization and, and almost like driving a bottoms-up advocacy works it, it actually does it does a lot or even just having conversations with other shareholders about issues which in turn get brought up by those shareholders to the management team and suddenly it's this game of try to show the board and the management team that there is this you know, emerging narrative that we need to address that goes beyond them having control this is why i love this gets into like busted IPOs, but this is why I like you know, companies that go into sell-offs because we kind of get this reset to first principles 
and it, it's kind of a reminder of like, well, what got us here in the first place? And oftentimes management teams are, are the most open during these periods because they, they do want to get it right. They want to figure it out, right? I mean, you know, Snapchat got a lot of heat because they went public with no voting class shares. But what happened when the stock blew up? I mean, it, was, it went down to what, five, six bucks a share near, near the bottom? Suddenly, they kind of refocused, and, and obviously, they had the trends in their favor. But you know, I, I always joke like, when, when a stock blows up, wait for the CEO letter <laughs> to employees that says, I'm sorry, and, and this is what we're doing, and then go long. <laughs> right? Oh, <There's> a... <laughs> and it kind of happened at Snapchat. It, it's, it's funny because it, it seems to happen like it, it happens a lot. There is kind of this notion of like, you get product market fit, you're on a rocket ship, you think you're just like a rock star, and you are a rock star, but you get punched in the face or half the rocket fuel like blows up and you're just kind of drifting and now you got to figure out, well, where we go from here. And during those moments, you actually can add a lot of value and be very influential without having any voting control. You're just working with with the team and and advocating for things that you think that matter and and, and it comes from a place of, of caring. That's what I mean about like, there are actually a lot of soft approaches to drive changes and, and to be influential without having that voting control. You should never underestimate the power of a single voice to drive change. That's been hammered into my head for a very long time. And it was always kind of this thing where I think in most confrontations, people are like, yeah, we'll give you one board seat. But for a certain set of investor, like that one board seat is so powerful. Like now you gave me a seat at the table. I'm only one vote, but I'm now a potentially a disproportionate voice to advocate on behalf of shareholders or to basically now we're getting really into the view. So in the boardroom, there's this notion of collegial culture, right? You want to be collegial. You want to have, Mm -hmm. you know, thoughtful conversations, but you don't want to be a jerk about it. Yeah. You don't want to be the one that stirs the pot. You don't want to be the one that stirs the pot. Right. Well, the, I, I would say like it gets weaponized at times, right? Like it becomes a way of like shutting down thoughtful dissent or, or constructive criticism. And so oftentimes the activist, this is actually a very good demonstration of having influence without votes. As an activist, you represent a vessel for change. You represent perspectives that more often than not are thought internally, but can't get expressed. And so when you speak up, And you say something, more often than not, there is a group or a often a a significant group of board members and insiders who kind of agree but can't say what you're saying. And if you give them an opportunity to at least say, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, we should actually, what's so wrong with that suggestion? We should look into that. Just being able to let someone inside the organization go, hey, What's wrong with that? Why not look into that? Can set into motion some pretty powerful outcomes, some pretty powerful changes. It's kind of the good cop, bad cop dynamic. I guess I'll play the bad cop and say what everyone knows to be true here. Use me as as the excuse to to look into it, to, to advocate for it. Because now I'm speaking up, the other shareholders start recognizing, hey, this might be an issue. And now the board members can go, they're advocating this. Our shareholders are kind of supporting this. Maybe we need to look into it. And then suddenly, you know, a lot of change happens. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get the whole social group thing going, right? Where it's like, oh, well, this person's not afraid to stick up or speak up. And then other people get to speak up as well about an issue that bothers them. You're seeing it right now, actually. It's, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation about it. I mean, look at what happened over the last couple, I mean, it feels like years, but like, look at what happened the, the last few weeks, right? As far as Facebook and Twitter banning the president, right? Very big deal. And how that set into motion the reaction of other organizations. And now it's become this trend where everyone's just not donating to, you know, political PACs, right? It's like, oh, this is wonderful. Corporations are getting out of the lobbying game, right? <laughs> But it, <laughs> I didn't think this would be the catalyst, but okay, I'm down for this. But you know, there, there's that social proof where it's like, oh, it's okay to now do the hard decision because someone else already did it for me, right? It's now yeah. I can, I can, it's virtue signaling on one hand, but it's also like, you know what, for a lot of these companies, they probably 
wanted to do this for a very long time. And this was now the opportunity to do it. Right. But they were either, yeah. you know, there was definitely a lot of concern to do it in the past and, and, and rightfully so literally the same thing happens at a you know, organizational level. There are a lot of things people would like to do that they're too afraid. And, and oftentimes it takes that one gruffy activist to, to bring something up that maybe drives that change. And I personally you know, laugh, but when an activist goes on a board, it's like a switch turns on, right? It's like all these directors that were fighting you like become your allies, they're very friendly. Hmm. You'd be surprised how often several directors will go, we're glad, we're glad you're here. There's a lot of work to be done. Hmm. It's like once the dust settles, it becomes very clear that, yeah, there, there are a lot of things that, that you said that were right that we just couldn't agree with until you got here. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I love what's going on right now as far as seeing kind of, you know, certain concepts like you know, not contributing to, to PACs, like spread like wildfire, because it's kind of a very easy big picture example of what happens in in an organization a lot of your biggest critics from the outside suddenly become these allies and and obviously they have their own self-preservation considerations for doing that but they're also the folks that are trying to do the right thing but they're also trying to do it within the limits of maintaining their own careers and and networks professionally can't say certain things that opportunity to be outspoken is is very valuable what's funny is activism is kind of trending away because a lot of the concepts are are being embraced by others it's almost like the the new the new activist is the um billionaire twitter account that just kind of says whatever they want and they have the platform to call people out without consequence because they made their money right you know they got they got that sweet f you money so so use that, be the vessel for change, be willing to be outspoken, and, and maybe that, that drives thoughtful conversation that others can't really advocate because they, they don't have that platform. Yeah, I mean, there's something very freeing about that, right? You got that sweet Substack money, so some people <laughs> uh, don't even have that, right? I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but I do actually mean that there's an interesting thing going on. And it's not like it just started with the internet where, you know, any voice that has a legitimate idea has a shot at getting noticed. I mean, I've been shocked at some of the people that have reached out to me that said that they listen to what I'm doing. And I really appreciate it. But like, these are people that I used to idolize, you know, or work in shops that I still do idolize. The world is much more about whether or not your ideas are good now and can you add value it doesn't really matter anymore about you know who you are where you went to school it's more about whether or not your thoughts are good enough to erode the barriers you know the reason i started the newsletter in the first place was i was absolutely you know fascinated by the whole you know idea of online patronage and literally people just giving other people you know, money on the internet, right? And the idea that, you know, someday we're all going to be kind of enterprises of one who can, you know, essentially like make these API calls to different services to you know, fulfill, you know, back office or you know, front you know, or whatever need within an organization you can kind of outsource. That was fascinating to me. And this kind of ties back to, you know, just kind of technology and, and, and following the space for a very long time. I mean, I think we've all heard the whole like thousand true fans narrative and all you need is a thousand true fans to build something online. And and I I agree that's kind of true. What's actually remarkable is (laughs) tech has this like deflationary, you know, power to it, right? Where the cost goes down. You know, the, the, the idea of a thousand true fans is something that was coined, I think 10 years ago, a decade ago, you actually don't need a thousand true fans, right? The new take, I forgot who wrote it, but, there is something you said, you only need 100 true fans to build something meaningful online. That's a very powerful idea, a powerful concept. And so for me, when I started the newsletter, it was like, A, I just wanted to start writing again because I thought it would help improve my writing. It hasn't. I'm still kind of writing the same way as I hope to improve it. And the other was... I like how you write. I, <laughs> the way I describe my writing, so I used to be a terrible writer in high school. Actually, I have the same writing style. So however you think about my writing style today, that's how I wrote in high school. And I tried to improve it because I, don't know, I was terrible at English. And I, I hired a tutor. Class, This is a classic LA story. 
and he was helping me with my writing and then we did a writing assignment it's like man this is really good you should be a screenwriter I'm like what the hell are you talking about it's like oh i'm a screenwriter like like <laughs> like i just i just do the tutoring to make make some money it's like dude i'm just trying to get a decent score on my sat2 writing like is this gonna get me a high score or not <laughs> it's like oh well it's like, I, no i'm not actually trying to work as a screenwriter thank you <laughs> It's like actually no, that style probably isn't gonna work. My aspirational goal. Yeah, but yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of dog food this whole idea. Like I talk about it. You know, it's easy to talk about like recurring revenue, right? Software margin and network effects and tribes as a Twitter hot taker, right? On on FinTwit, it's easy. But it was always like, well, I, I talk about it. Like, can I actually do it? What would it actually be like? And so I was like, you know what? Let's try to dog food this. Let's see what happens. I think that's kind of the first thing, if anyone like dives into this, is how surprising that the community around you is in their support of what you're doing, right? And, and Bill, I, th I think you've kind of experienced this firsthand, just like you just don't realize how many people really are rooting for you until something happens or until you speak up or say something or you just kind of throw something out there. And the response is it's almost uh, this this fuel, right? It, it, it reinvigors you when, when even when you're kind of in, in the dumps or you just feel like, what the hell I'm doing? Like, I don't know if you do this, but like, I'm probably like twice a day, I go, what the hell am I doing? Like, what is going on? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything. I am so dumb right now. Like, why am I? Why? Why am I even like doing this right now? So, but, you know, the community is very, very supportive. They're very enthusiastic. And I, I will say that it is a very wonderful feeling to know that, like, you have some semblance of recurring revenue that you can rely on. And, and it's, I'm not beholden to a company or business or a boss to get by necessarily on, on my on my day to day. But my goal and my job is to serve my community of I mean, I, honestly, they're friends. I, I guess I can call them subscribers, but a lot of them are, are good friends that, that support me and, and, and are enthusiastic about you know, what, what I'm trying to do. That's a very freeing feeling, right? Like it, it, it makes it very, very hard to even consider like doing anything else or doing another gig. And it's exciting. And, and I, I'm excited from the sense that, so I did a write-up about a year ago about like the decade of influencer and, and influencer trends, right? And, and people always criticize like the Kardashians as far as like, you know, kind of selling out or like doing this and that. And, and my view was always, you should be super excited what they're doing because in order for, you know, Joe Schmuck like us to make a living <laughs> online sustainably. Yeah, the Kardashians had to trailblaze that. They have to trailblaze. Like you, like you need to be excited that, you know, they made a million bucks or more doing some promotion or, you know, some... You know, some girl like Charlie, you know, D'Amelio can get plucked out of obscurity via TikTok and become this uber celebrity tastemaker in less than a year, right? Like you need those precedents, you need those moments to go, hey, if you believe that one day you, you'll be able to be an enterprise of one, have a community around you that kind of supports what you're doing. And it doesn't have to be like this content creation, like someday I don't know, like the long tail, maybe you're just a rock star, like accountant, right? That just like is really good at this one thing. And, and you build a community of other accountants that's into that. And people pay to, to either, you know, follow what you're doing, but also maybe, you know, retain you for certain projects. Like, I think those outcomes are, are, are getting there, right? And, and uh, you know, personal branding becomes, I guess, more important and and in, in a lot of ways the internet has turned into kind of like throwback to kind of the mayberry lane kind of i don't know, mayberry street i forgot the place but where it's like there's a reason it's called a baker's dozen right and they throw in that extra like it, it becomes very kind of a neighborhood type it's internet scale but it almost feels very personal like what you're doing with folks because at the end of the day you only need to find 100 customers that are enthusiastic about what you're doing to have a living. We're almost getting back to those kind of days where you're just trying to run like a business and, and, and do the best you can and hope people recognize that. So I guess kind of wrapping it all up, I'm excited when I see what a Mr. Beast can do and, and drive change and, and, and run experiments. I'm, I'm excited when Dave Portnoy can fundraise for, for small businesses and restaurants 
those are the kind of wins and successes and cases of people rallying, you know, resources very quickly as one person to do some really remarkable scale things that lay the groundwork and, and trailblaze what others can hopefully do in time. I literally only turned on the premium newsletter February 2020. It's not even been a year for me. And it's been a, well, personally, my life is the same, but from a actually opportunities and getting certain messages out there and, and driving things that are important to me, that's, that's life changing, right? And it hasn't even been a year yeah. to be able to pull that off. That's a remarkable, remarkable thing to experience, but just to consider, right? Like, I mean, my Twitter account was basically a personal, I still treat it like a personal account, but now there's like a lot more people that follow. You went through the same thing, right? Like we were just like, you know, it's, it's, you yeah. know, who would have thought like, not me. Like, <laughs> like it's a very crazy thing where in a year, how much you can actually change the situation in your life. It's remarkable. And it, and it's not like, listen, I think I've, I've broken every rule as far as like what you're supposed to do in terms of running a newsletter and marketing and promoting. I think it took me eight months to realize I should probably add a sign up like section to my write-ups. So it's easy to find me and, and sign up to the newsletter. Like, but it still worked, right? Because at internet scale, like yeah. you don't need that many people. You just need to find people that believe in you and they, they will go out of their way to, to sign up. So that's a very exciting thing and for everyone you. and promote you. And I mean, it's, I, I think the word of mouth is, is really the more powerful part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had people ask me, you know, what do I do? And the answer is I had a situation that occurred in my life when my uncle died, just a tragic death. And it sort of changed what I had to be able to manage, right? I was at a bank and there was no way that continuing down the path that I was going to continue down if I had implemented a financial strategy that I didn't believe in, and let's say March 2020 comes and I bail, right? That error would have cost me more than I would have accumulated at my job. That said, I mean, I don't have like true fuck you money at all. So I got to figure something out, right? So it's not as if I'm just some retired guy in Florida here. But what's nice about having the time to figure this out is, you know, it's enabled me to reconnect with Toby and Toby gave me the platform of value after hours. And that sort of, you know, elevated my, I don't know, I guess following base or whatever. And then I was intelligent enough to open my mind to some really smart people that I get to interact with on a day to day basis. And that completely changed the way that I think. So the way that 2020 goes for me, okay, is I get on value after hours in 2019. That gets me noticed, and I go out to give a presentation to a group somewhere about investing. I don't, I go out to talk to this group, and like, I don't go and pitch myself and talk about how great I am. Instead, I I talked more about my mistakes, right? It was like not self promotion, it was true giving. So, that that resulted in the group liking me and somebody sending me a speech about coronavirus in February, right? I was long airlines and banks. So by March 12th, I knew that this is going to be way bigger than people thought. So I was out of those totally, right? So then I go to, to June and I had some really tragic shit happen in my personal life. And Twitter was there to help me fight Robin Hood. And now I'm doing this podcast that people seem to like. I mean, I don't know where the world is going for me, but what I'm trying to build here is, uh, you know, something that adds value to people's life every day. And I'm starting to see the benefits that I never thought that I'd see. And, you know, for me, I just keep my, try to keep my nose to the grindstone and take an idea seriously, which is find good businesses and pay reasonable prices to buy them. And then I'm trying to give back in whatever way I can. And to your point, you know, like the fact that I could be doing this and people would be interested in what I have to stay, say, and I could make the connections that I've been able to make and be in some of the rooms that I've been fortunate enough to find myself in. Like, that's incredible, man. That never would have happened in a different time. 
And it's, it's honestly, the results have changed my life. What a time to be alive <laughs> from, from that perspective. But I think you, know, you bring up a very, I think you bring up something very important here. I think it's very easy for you know, successful investors to kind of backfill the mythology of what the journey is like and, and just, you know, I'm a great investor. I, I, I generate phenomenal returns. I get LPs and now I'm a, you know, this, this uh, you know, rich hedge fund manager type. You know? and, and the reality is there's a real grind to a lot of these things. And, it, you know, the sausage isn't pretty and there's a lot of sacrifice and, and, and life happens. The more you, you can understand and, and accept that as part of your journey, you know, the more freeing it'll be for you. I mean, when I, when I left the industry five years ago, a lot of it had to do with, so I started a nonprofit, partly probably a similar story. So like, you know, my uncle was very ill and you know, I stayed to help and I was very active in that part of my life. And I really didn't care about my career at that point. I just graduated, like I'll figure it out later. But having that kind of, you know, perspective to step up and help out and, and, and really just recognize what really matters in your life was, was a big, big deal for me, which pro- honestly probably got me my first internship investing anyway was sharing that sort of story people understanding you know, sacrifice and so you know fast forward to five years ago it was nonprofit days so relational shut down partly because uh, ralph whitworth got cancer and, and passed and so the fund shut down for various reasons but you know key man provision being you know, the primary that kind of you know makes you think like well what am i doing what am i really enjoying this? Is, is this something I, I want to do for a long time? Or am I just you know, chasing an incremental dollar? And there's nothing wrong with chasing dollars, if that's what you want to do. And, and if you want to build wealth, you know, more power to you. But that was definitely something that I wasn't sure about, right? And, and what drove me to, to leave the industry. And, and I joke, like I literally went, I, I learned software, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the meme, like, you know, cynical approach, like you should learn the code. It's like, you know what? Maybe I will learn a code. Dude, I may go learn a code <laughs> as a backup plan. I, I, I will learn a code. And then, yeah, the wife, the wife was very supportive. And she was like, you know what? Like, it's a stressful, the stressful business, a stressful job. Like, a death really does affect people in various ways, right? And like, you know what? Like, let's do it. Let's try something different. And, and, and we did. With the caveat being... I was a technology investor, and this was probably 2015, 2014, and that was probably as a fortuitous window to basically, you know, set your portfolio to tech and forget it and go do something else for the next five years. And that's literally what, you know, I got lucky there, right? Like, you're not, (laughs) you're you're not going to have many opportunities where you can just go, you know what, let me, uh, let me go buy a little bit of that uh, match. IPO and, and, and a few other names. What, what's that? What, a shop? You know, like, like, th- like you just start buying, you know, SaaS names before people realize in marketplaces. I mean, I think I was in Etsy at six bucks a share or two at the time. Just set and forget it, you know, not thinking about it and go, go try to figure out your life. Like, yeah, got very lucky. This isn't like, I'm not trying to, like, this wasn't a galaxy brain thing. It was just, I was in tech. These were the names that I was comfortable looking at. And I thought, I think they'll generate slightly better returns than the S&P 500, so I'm going to own them instead. Uh, that's cool. Go figure out my life, and and this isn't. That's why I joke like I don't have fu money, but like I have that sweet Substack subscriber money, and and, and really what that it is Substack money, man, got that sweet Substack money. But the messaging, the point is, is like I'm very, and this was a decision I had to make a long time when I left the industry. Like, are you, regardless of what happens, are you comfortable with with kind of you know how things may play out? And I think, yeah, I think you have to be to a certain extent. I, I know we've kind of gone through kind of the life philosophy track here versus the investing conversation. But no, like, man, that's what these conversations are for. <laughs> it's all good. But it's, I think it's important to have some, you know, some level of big picture context where it's like, I will say a lot of my decisions have been driven by talking to like really much older, successful people. And, you talk to real, you know much older successful people it never at least the ones that seem more grounded and the ones on tv they give much different advice but like it's never like do this to make more money or do that or you know career centric necessarily it's always like you know like you're not going to appreciate it but 
don't be afraid to spend more time with, with your family or your friends in your 30s if you can. Everyone's on kind of the, the hamster wheel and, and like, don't worry, that, that will all, that, you know, the, the rat race will always be there for you if that's what you want to do afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you can't get your, your 30s back. You can't get that time back, right? Like, what's an extra a few million dollars when you're 80? Like, I'd trade that for another year of just having like, you know, weekly conversations with my uncle, right? Or, or, or another family member have that context to actually enjoy what what you're doing here this is a very we're getting very millennial like live your live your life but um there's uh yeah but dude we're not really getting that millennial because <clears throat> what we're not saying is like you know just go smoke hopium and don't do anything and you and i are both grinding in our own way right it's yeah. just we did both take a risk to go outside of you know the traditional route and like i fear right like thank god i performed well last year because if i didn't let's say i held banks and airlines going into last year now maybe i'm sitting here needing a job all of a sudden and i tell people i underperformed and how'd you do it you did it owning banks and airlines how stupid are you like that would be terrifying and what would i do in that case i don't know you know my whole world could be different right so Every single day I wake up, there's part of me that feels like I'm hanging on a thread. But, you know, I'm just going to go out and do the best that I can do and try to deserve the position that I have, be grateful for the opportunity, and try not to fuck it up, to be totally honest. And if I do that, I'm going to hope that enough of the people that listen to this and have gotten to know me sort of understand that I'm here giving it my all. If I do lose everything or I need to get a job or something, I'm going to be hungry. I got small kids I got to feed, and I'm not all that worried about how hard I'm going to work. This podcast is sort of my, you know, bet on myself a little bit, and we'll see where it goes. I think you, you bring up a very good point, and I think this is something that, regardless of what you do and, and the decisions you make, the highest conviction decision in your life should be a willingness to bet on yourself. If you're not full conviction on betting on yourself, it's very hard to be full conviction on any other decision in life. And so that doesn't mean it's going to work out and there's a lot of risk, but like 10 out of 10 times in a scenario where I need to bet on myself, I'll, I'll do it and I'll figure it out and we'll go from there. It's a very interesting time, I mean, in my life. And I mean, listen, like I could bet and, and I fully acknowledge I can bet on myself partly because I did do buy side and like, Corporate governance dark arts, is, it's a fun branding, but the, you can generate a return on investment on, on a risk adjusted basis doing this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all kind of have our value investing origin story, right? Where we all, you know, where the light bulb went off. And, you know, I think for me, what really resonated with the whole was the whole kind of, you know, Joel Greenblatt of, you know, event driven ideas, as well as kind of the Seth Klarman, you know, margin of safety approach, right? Like, when you kind of like read their origin stories and their investment strategies back in the day, you're almost like scratching your head. Like, I can't believe like those opportunities were out there. Right. Like you're like, you mean the market was just giving out like yeah. these ideas and like, just like that, like it wasn't arbitraged. Obviously it's, you know, the arbitrage is, there's been some arbitrage to those opportunities, but that always stuck. Right. Like, are there any you know nooks and crannies in the market that I can try to find these sort of like I can't believe the market isn't properly you know, pricing this in opportunities and I would actually say corporate governance research is probably one of the last pools I've found where this is still kind of like uh, literally you find kind of Joel Greenblatt Seth Klarman type arbitrage type situations that you can't believe the market hasn't properly priced but I think there's a reason for that right like it's there's still a lot of judgment and, and you're still like making certain assumptions that can't really be quantified necessarily. So there's always that that's probably going to you know, keep these mispricings in place, but also, you know, the other market participants aren't really looking at it from a certain way. Right. So I always say because of that, like there's actually some really interesting investment opportunities in this space in general. But if you're an investor, if you get one takeaway from this conversation, this lovely, wonderful, meandering conversation we've had, which I love, by the way. I, I love, I love, I love this format. This is my investment advice. As an investor, 
if you can do corporate governance research and really get a good handle of it, the return on time of looking at a proxy and corporate governance is remarkable. I mean, you can maybe spend 30 to 60 minutes on this and, and develop thesis changing insights to your process. And this is like, this is literally something you can add to your existing process that doesn't disrupt everything else you do, right? Like other people will give different recommendations on, on research and, and, and how to you know, look at the world and integrate this and that. This literally, you can spend a half hour in afternoon like reading and, and, and just capture some insight that's like, wait a minute, you say that you're focused on this sort of North Star and these, this is how you manage the business, but your long-term equity comp is tied to one-year EBITDA. That mismatch then, then pushes you down the research rabbit hole, and, and suddenly you realize, oh no, like this is actually, you know, this is actually the telltale signs of potentially a very bad acquisition coming into the pipe, which has happened for sure. And that's that's always been kind of my one one takeaway is. At the end of the day, all of us are trying to forecast valuations, and, and that process is built around forecasting that, but it's usually around the traditional levers, right? Operations, customer research, data-driven stuff. But I think even more importantly, if you can try to forecast and anticipate the incremental decisions that a management team and board are mulling over time, you have a massive advantage to other participants that have that hole in the process, right? That's when you get those weird windows of, of opportunity like like HD Supply, who incidentally was spun out of Home Depot when I was involved at Home Depot. That was kind of one of the agenda items that we did was the spin out HD Supply, which is, you know, great business. And it was just this very long journey for HD Supply to clean up their portfolio. They brought on activists who were on the board. And if you actually followed the business and, and kind of the divestors over time, last year, back in November, there was just a random press release uh, or, or Bloomberg article that, that Lowe's might be you know, kicking the tires on HD supply. And there was this whole sequence of events that Lowe's quickly you know, denied the, the rumor and, and the stock you know, that initially popped on the report just kind of like erased all those gains. And if you're just kind of thinking about how these board members and, and these executives were were thinking as far as next steps, you, you kind of went, oh my goodness, they actually might be running a process right now. They actually might be selling the company. And the reason for this was the report came out in November. Before that news came out, we know that they announced, they sold one of the business units and basically had a pretty big inflow of cash. And, and they needed to do something with this cash, right? They had activists on the board that had been on the board for, say, three years. So you already know, three years, you know they're kind of going on. the. This is kind of the back end of the project, right? They're trying to wrap it up. They, they all want to kind of exit this situation eventually. Up to that point, too, HD Supply, now that last divestiture completely cleaned up the business portfolio so that arguably the quote-unquote really good business was all that was left. So we have this situation where you have a ton of cash. You have activists that are on the board that are kind of at the back end of their engagement cycle. You have a completely cleaned up business, which arguably a lot of other strategics find potentially attractive. And, and I'm pretty sure a lot of Home Depot executives have you know, on occasion mentioned that was one business that they wish they didn't have to divest uh, for a good reason. And then you have this random Lowe's report in Bloomberg saying like they may be doing a deal. It's like that's actually the perfect time to consider strategic alternatives because you want to do it before you, you make any sort of significant capital allocation decision on that huge you know lump of cash, cash that yeah, came in, cash, right? Yeah. That pile of cash. If you're planning on doing an aggressive buyback or something else, like you would want to evaluate your options. And so when Lowe's quickly like shot down the report, I was like, just think of this in common sense terms. Most companies don't comment on rumors. Like, so from a process perspective, just from a governance decision-making perspective, for them to immediately respond to that report, like literally put out a filing, I was like, you don't do that unless there's actually some real smoke. 
Yeah, that's right. There's got to be something there. There's something here. And so my, my whole write up, my whole, and it's unlocked. Like you literally, like it's not a premium write up anymore. You can actually read it for yourself. My whole quote unquote thesis was okay. Like we're actually in the ninth inning of, of a lot of like very important decisions for the activists, for the company, for the business. And, and now they actually have to make a decision on this cash. And they'll probably make the announcement by December or whenever they, they report. So we have now this 30-day window that they actually have to make a decision. And lo and behold, we get this you know, Bloomberg article noting there may be you know, acquisition interests. That tells me there's a very good shot that they're running a process right now. And they're using, you know, we're getting into media news flow, which is a whole separate conversation, to kind of negotiate in public and try to like, even if Lowe's wasn't interested and, and they vigorously denied it, that news report is going to send cause a lot of other funds and acquires just to send. Yeah, somebody it, it, else is coming. They're going to send inbounds, right? I read this article. You call mm-hmm. HD Display. Hey, like, is this true? Like, if it is, we want to be part of the process. Mm-hmm. But you can't really connect those dots unless you spend that 30 to 60 minutes thinking about corporate governance here. Hmm. You pre-merger arbed it. Yeah, right? I got lucky, right? Because I think it was like three days later they actually announced a deal. So they definitely moved moved along very quickly. I, I suspect you know, Home Depot probably like saw that they cleaned up the portfolio. They had a ton of cash and they wanted to make sure they got a deal done before they decided to you know, make other commitments or potentially do an acquisition, right? That, that was you know the other thing that maybe they would have done with cash. I don't know. That sort of thinking, that sort of like, if we're in the game of forecasting valuations, I was trying to forecast decisions. And by trying to forecast those decisions, you know, sometimes um, these opportunities pop up, uh, risk adjusted opportunities where, you know what, like if it didn't work out, it was already trading at valuations that implied there was no process happening anyway. So from an upside downside perspective, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I think this is a, a perfectly suitable opportunity potentially. That's something you don't pick up on necessarily unless you're doing the work on, on this sort of stuff. Do you mind circling back to your comment on Newsflow? Yeah, certainly. So I'm working on a write-up around narrative is very popular right now. Obviously, with this market, it's all narrative investing, I would say. A very underappreciated part of the activist engagement process is actually communications and narrative. And what I mean is when we get on board, when we work behind the scenes, or even when we're not on the board, one of the big levers that we actually have is communication. Most people, when they think about activist investing, they they think kind of the traditional levers, whether it's operations, capital allocation, so on and so forth. But those decisions don't get instantaneously priced into the stock, right? I, I say it a lot, but good capital allocation credit in the marketplace takes time. And part of the reason it takes time is you have to walk the walk one, but you also have to be able to communicate your story and basically show marked progress towards what you're saying. There's nothing more powerful than having a target saying it and then, and then showing progress toward that target. It definitely does drive upside from an activist investment perspective. So within that context of communication, sometimes you know our projects involve strategic alternatives. Sometimes involves either, you know, M&A, whether it's divesting or, or acquiring certain businesses. And basically having a seat behind the scenes and seeing certain you know, deals play out in the boardroom. And then see, like, I don't know how this information gets out there. I, I don't know what drives certain things, but you'd be surprised like when you're sitting with board level visibility of things going on and certain just articles and information gets out there in the press and you're able to directly connect it to what you're going on at the board level, that was kind of like a, like a jarring moment for me. I was like, holy crap, like, there's, like, there's some real news flow. And there's like, you can say maybe it's leaks and, and it's a bad thing, but the counter is you're negotiating in public. You're doing certain things that um, I don't know who's doing it. I don't know who's putting it out there. But sometimes information gets out there that may be beneficial to the process. Maybe it gets, it gets more inbound interest. I don't know. But you go through enough of these projects and you see that news flow play out on top of knowing that how important communication and narrative is to stock valuation. Uh, needless to say, I, I notice 
certain headlines and certain articles and I just read different stories much differently because of that experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because it comes from that context of these sources don't come out of the blue, right? These publications don't just publish stuff unless the quality of the source and the relationship to the source is rock solid. And, and this is where you get into like, okay, there's a big difference between, you know, reporting a rumor from one publication to another, right? Like there's definitely, there's definitely a whole game within a game of like, who's willing to report what. And like, there's obviously certain publications that are much more likely to, to publish what a, you know, hedge fund manager wants them to put out there in a narrative versus what the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg is willing to put out there as kind of reporting institutions from a reputational perspective. And so by, by kind of tying in, here's a piece of information from a reputable source who wouldn't report this un unless that source had good information. And then the reaction that the other players that are responding to this, there's signal there. This is in the premium, but I've definitely done a lot of write-ups around kind of the food delivery space around this media news flow and what information gets kind of you know, hmm, yeah. bubbled out of the blue. You know, into the Wall Street Journal or, or somewhere else. It was, there was a whole full-fledged... I mean, I, I, I did a whole tweet storm, I think, when Grubhub did their whole infamous letter that blew up the stock and that they were going to kind of you know, mimic or, or adopt some DoorDash policies and they, they were going to cut their EBITDA profitability. It was a very you know, drastic shift in strategy, but there was a ripple effect in the industry at the time, right? By doing that, because you know, it, it's easy in hindsight to go like DoorDash did a great job and look at the valuation now, but at the time, like we're talking like WeWork was, you know, dead on arrival. DoorDash probably needed a raise capital, but like, you know, their last round was you know, arguably rich at the time. And this was kind of this game within a game of trying to force different players to react and behave in certain ways that was basically expressed through communication, through media news flow, right? Like, you know, Grubhub, they did what they did in it and it hurt their stock, but it also, you know, sent into motion other reactions with other players, which in turn caused a lot of chatter around consolidation and strategic alternatives and, and ultimately led to like rumors of Uber trying to acquire the business before Takeaway took it up. But honestly, like now that we know what happened, if you actually laid out all the different articles from Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg and all the other publications, you can kind of see like who is feeding who in this whole lead up, in this whole landscape. It's, it's really like a fun and fascinating thing in terms of how it all played out. Like literally how DoorDash, Postmates, Uber Eats, Grubhub, Takeaway, how they all kind of reacted and incrementally how their decisions evolved based on what you know, certain things were happening in, in the marketplace. And I mean, it's, it was surprising for me. I was like, this is happening in broad daylight, and no one seems to be talking about this. This is like the most. Yeah, this is the most amazing thing like ever, and like no one wants to talk about it. Which is, I don't know. I admit. what was super cool about watching you go through that is everybody else was scared from that letter, and you were the one that had the open mind to be like, "Nah, something's going on here," and you pretty much bottom tick that, if I recall correctly. And a lot of that was through the process that you're describing right now. Right. And I mean, that's pretty cool because your frame of reference enabled you to be creative in a way that the market was unable to be. And you can make a lot of money when you see that. And you're right. I don't care what the frame of reference is. It's a variant way of looking at the same situation. It's basically what made me money on Curate. Yeah. I think as an investor, I, I like hammer this like into my investor friends all the time when, when they, you know, say there there's a name that you follow closely there's always a window of opportunity where and we'll talk about it where it's like the valuation doesn't make sense relative to like what's going on the fundamentals you know there, there's certain reasons for it from their perspective and and my pushback was always well not pushback but my feedback was always yeah it doesn't make sense to you because you, you follow it like as close as your kids you know in the park like you you know this thing better than everyone else. What yeah. what you don't realize is you have currently a window of opportunity to make a decision in the portfolio before everyone else. But that window may only be one, two, four weeks before other folks figure it out. So you need to decide whether this is 
an appropriate risk and you know risk adjusted opportunity to have a little bit more conviction. I, I I joke that there's probably a portion of my portfolio specifically allocated for thoughtful investors I talk to who are extremely animated about names <laughs> that they literally just go, this doesn't make sense. And and you just kind of pick up that pattern recognition of like, I can recognize a very enthusiastic investor that loves a certain stock that just can't understand the situation and I will buy that. Like I, I will ride your coat. I have no problem riding your coattails because I trust your judgment here. And yeah, I think there are certain windows uh, of opportunity, whether it's me using corporate governance and, and my background, you know, activist investing or, or anyone else and, and kind of their process where you know, you'll have a differentiation. This is, this is kind of, you know, when you get into investing in moats and, and differentiation and everything else, like I say, if your process is really good, it will probably bubble up windows of opportunity to buy. And that's all you can ask for in this market. If, if you're trying to outperform, if you're trying to do well, it's like, I just want to make sure that my process gives me enough windows of opportunity that if I allocate it well enough, that it, they're not all gonna be winners, but that batting average will, will play out in a way that I will be able to do well for myself. That's all you can ask for. Right now, like in this market, I'm like, there's no window of opportunity for me, <laughs> for my process uh, on the long side. <laughs> like if, if, you, if, if you're a subscriber to the newsletter, if you're, or if you're not, really right now, I'm probably more focused on bearish signals through corporate governance. What are the decisions companies do that signal bearishness? So a lot of my, you know, the last couple articles are, are kind of thematically around those sort of topics. So like, you know, if 2020 was a year of like corporate governance, long investing, 2021, maybe the year of corporate governance, short investing, even though I don't really short, but you know, I, I like writing about it nevertheless. So well, <laughs> the, the, the windows of opportunity are, are probably there. They're just a little bit different and outside of my typical investing wheelhouse. Yeah. A tweet that you had sent out that I thought was super interesting was how you said that you thought that it was more likely for management teams not to get options this year, right? If they think their stock is extended, they don't want the options because of the strike prices. So this year, we should be looking for different forms of compensation that management teams are looking for and maybe be aware of how that goal may be moving or the signals that they may be sending by requesting different payments. Oh, absolutely. You know, just to take the opposite of that view, what happened in 2020 when the market blew up? A lot of companies shifted compensation to option. And a lot of them shifted to out of the money options, which was, you know, a really, you know, bullish signal and really kind of signal like, hey, like this may be an opportunity to get the stock at prices that the management team was willing to take options when historically they were, you know, performance-based heavy or RSU-based heavy, right? Like they want they wanted that upside opportunity. So they they shifted. Yeah. So 2020 was, you know, it was a banner year for that sort of investment signaling. And so this year, yeah, we're probably gonna see the opposite. And it makes a lot of sense, right? If you know, Bill, you're you're CEO of a company. 2020 was an awesome year. You, you bottom ticked it. You actually requested options with a ten dollar strike price, and you know, fast forward to today, the stock's seventy bucks a share, right? You're 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 sitting pretty, but lo and behold, compensation equity granting season's about to happen, right? I get my annual grants every March. Stock seventy bucks a share. Do I really want options with a seventy dollar strike price if I think intrinsic is you know, something else uh, that the upside just isn't there? No. Actually, compensation committee, I don't want options. Give me performance-based shares priced at you know, target, you know, 70 bucks a share so that at least, hey, I'll have some metrics or hurdles where you'll pay me out in upside if I hit my performance hurdles. And then knowing that like, hey, if, if this thing sticks at 70 over the next three years, I'll get a nice return. So you know, that's a human nature, well understood sort of request, right? Like when things get ahead of ourselves, management teams will try and, and boards this isn't a bad thing right if you're a board sometimes you have no choice but to do this because you want to keep people incentivized you want to keep people motivated yeah. and if yeah. if you're giving That's them right. options that inevitably are flat to underwater what happens you're going to have to reload them down the road anyway so you might as well just do it now if if the internal expectation is you know the current valuation has gone ahead of itself right 
So when people think of capital allocation, what do they say when the stock is overvalued? You issue shares. You issue stock because it's, it's good currency, you raise cash, or you do acquisitions with that cheap currency. There's a similar you know, philosophy with compensation. When the stock is deeply undervalued, you issue options. When the stock is overvalued, you go to more either cash or restricted or performance-based equity compositions. So like, you almost think of like compensation the same way you think about capital allocation. There are certain decisions you're going to make depending on the valuation of the stock, whether it's you know, your CapEx or incremental spending or your incremental compensation structure. It's just a natural thing to do. And, and you'll also repurpose compensation around strategy, no different than you repurpose capital allocation around strategy. So Disney, right, you're going over the top, you want to invest in content, you know, maybe even Dan, you know, Dan is probably, Dan Loeb is probably right, maybe cut your div dividend and redeploy it into this you know, high growth opportunity that, by the way, the market's paying top dollar for right now. If you're going to do that with your capital allocation, you're going to have to readjust your compensation structure at Disney, right? If, if your compensation structure is more tied to EPS or, you know, certain ROIC metrics that don't, you know, yeah. that, that yeah, don't that align with, with this Disney Plus initiative, you have to readjust. So that's probably the most intuitive way for a lot of investors to think about compensation governance is think about the things that you'd want changed from a capital allocation perspective as, as an investor, and then think, how does that get expressed from a compensation and governance perspective? So if you're going to make you know, changes or if you think the stock's overvalued or undervalued, those same considerations are getting expressed in the boardroom through compensation. So something that you had written up and this is not to talk like bullishly or bearishly. Regeneron, when you see somebody take forward, what was it? Like five years of compensation and put it in, what was it, RSUs? What did they take? Either way, they basically front-loaded all of their options for the next five years, right? We got to see how the stock goes, but reading the tea leaves, it's probably not too bearish, probably right? It... I mean, just like knowing nothing else. Right. This is not advice. So in general, whenever you see like a front loaded compensation package involving you know, several years of, of equity, regardless of the composition, it could be RSUs, it could be options or anything else. That's an explicit decision. That's a decision that goes kind of outside your normal best practices, standard practice type of thinking. So right, right out of the gate, you know, and, and this is this happened at Regeneron and this happened at a lot of other situations I've written about, but also, you know, just kind of followed over the, you know, just investing in general. That sort of decision had to be discussed and debated and contemplated and, and put in. And more often than not, if you're doing a multi year grant like that, you're also signaling that you have a pretty bullish view on the opportunity ahead of you. Now that doesn't mean it's going to work out, right? There, there are always certain scenarios where it doesn't work out or, or outcomes, right? You can't, you know, you could be front end loaded and be completely you know, bullish on, on a situation and then COVID-19 hits and, oh, by the way, you're in the, uh, you're in the travel business. You're kind of screwed, right, <laughs> on those grants. Yeah. Uh, but in, in a normalized, you know, all things considered operating environment, that's a very bullish signal. So now I know this transaction is bullish it's my job as an investor, as a uh, you know, sleuth, so to speak, is to figure out, well, what is the potential reasons that you know, Regeneron or someone else is bullish to do this transaction? Can I actually piece it together and connect? We already know the end decision. We already know the grant was the decision. Can we connect the sequence of events or information that makes this decision make sense? Yeah. And, and what that potentially signals. That's where there's a lot of magic, right? Because when, when, you, when you come across a situation like that and you see it, it, it really helps, A, remove kind of you know, certain dead money situations or risk you know, when, when you're a value investor. Mm. Like, mm. Every, everyone wants to like, wait until the catalyst is just there to get into a name, right, to participate on the upside. Yeah. But it's hard to uh, you know, figure that out outside of corporate governance compensation is probably one of the few places where you can actually literally wait and the insiders will tell you okay now's the time to to get in like i can't predict when the catalyst is about to play out or, or what it's going to be but they'll signal when the inflections like in the pipeline 
and, and there's visibility. That's how I think about, you know, that situation. But like, you know, last year, I like, you'll, you'll see this every now and then. Like, so GE with their CEO did a new management agreement and he got a slug of equity as part of the renewal with, I think there was definitely price-based investing hurdles, I believe. I get these comp plans all mixed up. But the point is, you know, GE obviously has their challenges and, and, and the thing has been kind of languishing and there's you know, this dead money dynamic to a certain extent as they try to turn things around. And they had accounting controversies and out of the blue, they decided to do this you know, renewal. At this particular time with the CEO, give them this large grant, I'm like, I didn't do a full write-up on it. It was kind of a bonus throwaway comment. I was like, kick the tires on this one. This one's a potentially you know interesting if you're kind of in the industrial space or or you kind of cover GE. And lo and behold, it, like you know, the stock just starts ripping like a quarter after this compensation and agreement is put in place. For those that may not follow the story, just for a little bit of background, you're talking about Larry Culp, who had a background at Donahar. I mean, one of the greatest CEOs ever following Flannery, who got axed because he was sort of moving too slowly. So you've got a setup where you really do have a bombed out equity and a story that's been really beaten up. I got caught up in GE. I think that it was around like 15 bucks a share, but I was lucky to get out around 13. Anyway, I still think it's a hell of an asset base. I don't quite think it's what I thought it was at one point, but it is a good asset base in my estimation. And that's one of the best managers ever to play the game and now he's rebasing his salary at a low so yeah that's that's interesting yeah i i think in my write-up i joke that this is like how soon before the market starts calling this dan her 2.0 right but to your point of like you know you follow ge for a long time and then invested in the stock you know i'm sure at, at certain points this is kind of going back to spending 30 60 minutes in corporate governance can be thesis changing where Hey, if, if you saw this management agreement and then you saw the structure of his equity comp and then you, you just kind of connect the dots of, of his background and, and kind of, you know, what was implied in the stock price at the time, that was probably a very good risk adjusted opportunity for you know, thoughtful GE investors to invest and, and get, get long the name that they understand yeah. or, or followed for a long time and kind of get, get behind the team because Again, like these sort of decisions are very like thought out and explicit. This isn't like part of the normal course of, of governance and compensation. There's a lot of reasons and, and specifics around why you do a grant like that at the time. And oh, by the way, if you're about to commit to a large grant where like at Regeneron, where the management team will not get equity for the next four to five years, you're going to want to get the stock price right. You're going to want to get Right, like you're gonna to want to get it right. If yeah. if that team thinks the price is overvalued, and it's gonna be a languishing stock or maybe like a declining stock, they would be the first to push back on a front-loaded arrangement. Absolutely, be the first to push back on a front-loaded. They would go just give me my equity every year. On the other hand, if there's upside opportunity, if there's an opportunity where they think that the market's not fully appreciating what's getting built here at the company, who's actually gonna bring up? a front-loaded equity grant compensation structure. It's typically not the board. It's usually the management team. Yeah, not somebody that's on a bunch of other boards doing things the normal way. They're not going to... No, it's management team going like, we think there's something very excited and we want to stay retained and motivated, compensation committee. Yeah. Like, and, hmm. and like our comp consultant says, this is, a, this is a good way to keep us engaged. We kind of agree. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I guess... We'll do our work and talk to the same compensation consultant, and they'll sign off on this structure. Oh, they'll, <laughs> they'll agree, and then we'll give you a front-loaded grant at these prices, right? It's never, it's like it's never a comp committee board member going, you know what? Like things look great. Let's like let's actually give them a front-loaded equity grant. That's not how those grants get bubbled. It's suggested by one of the power brokers, whether it's the CEO or chairman or you know someone else that's like all right, this is the get paid window for you guys. And, and when, when those sort of decisions happen, you could ride alongside. You could, like, so I don't recommend doing this on just names blindly, but I, I am self-aware that I do it myself just because, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, like, I'm, I'm, com I'm comfortable with it. I, I, I've seen enough of these to know which scenarios I can go long in and which scenarios where I'm like, mm, like I, I get the transaction, but I don't, I don't like the opportunity. But 
if you follow a stock or you follow a name or, or an industry and, and you come across something like that and you're able to blend in you know, through mosaic theory, what you already understand about this business and it ties into you know, those bullish signals tie into that grant, which seem to signal the same bullishness. Now you have that window of opportunity to get much bigger with much conviction before anyone else figures out what the hell is going on. And, and it, that window of opportunity might only be a couple of weeks, might be a week. I don't know. But like, it literally is kind of one of those windows where it's like, this is a 5% position. This was already something I was incrementally hoping to add on to. You get that filing. Should this be a 10% position? Or I mean, depending on how you approach portfolio construction, yeah, like, yeah, yeah is, should this be one of my number one names at this point? given this piece of information. Yeah, it should potentially influence the conviction that you have in the work that you've done, right? Or, to your point, if it's bearish, maybe it makes you think twice about what might I be missing. Oh, or or you can unload it, right? If if the equity grant is done in a way where it's like, wow, there this is a really like, you know, bearish sort of decision given the stock doesn't seem to indicate you should really be doing it this way, maybe I should lighten up. I will say if you integrate corporate governance and compensation analysis well into your process, more often than not, at some point in time in the future, your portfolio, your top position will probably have been informed by, by that research. And you'll probably get out of certain stocks that signal bearishness before it blows up as well. So you will probably drive some real incremental you know, returns with something that you can literally spend 30 to 60 minutes on in your process when researching a stock and that's where it's like i don't know why others don't really do it maybe because they weren't forced to do it like i was and realized it but it's easy to think it's boring but you experience corporate governance research in a way where you identify an opportunity that you already like and, and it drives that conviction and it works out for you suddenly you're just like you're you're hooked right i mean if, if it gets really bad you'll, you'll start reading proxy statements at like <laughs> at, at midnight on a Friday instead of being social like me and just be a complete <laughs> proxy degenerate. But they're fun, right? Like, I'm like no, I'm reading proxy. I'm reading pro- <laughs> yeah. I thought, uh, was I not clear? I am having fun. But instead of reading it as like, just like drudgery, you're reading it as far as like, can I anticipate the decisions that drove this? Can I anticipate the next decision? It's almost like a narrative is forming when, when you read these documents that you can't really get the same kind of narrative reading a 10K or, or, or other things, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's right. And one of the things that, you know, is why I'm not only comfortable with highlighting you, but also really wanted to highlight you before the rebasing season starts is, I think, not much what is it after the first 20% of your research or whatever, there really isn't that much incremental research that you're going to do that changes your mind very much. To me, this is really one of these tools in the toolbox that should at least be a checklist item, right? What's going on with the comp scheme, maybe what's gone on the past three or five years or whatever's changing. To me, it's a little negligent not to have this as a tool in your toolbox. I got to ask you also, I'll let you finish that thought, but then I, I got to ask you something about reading question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I was about to say, it's funny because I think the first time we, we met in person was, uh, I think it was a Peter Kaufman dinner out here in LA. Yep. And it was, uh, it, was, it was the first time I felt like a celebrity because Bill, oh, I, I go up to Bill, <laughs> yeah, he's like, so you're like, you're, you're, you're non-gap. I'm like, what the hell? I, I mean, I think I had like, a few hundred followers at the time or, or, or whatever. I was like, what is, is it like, do you want an autograph? This, I, this is new to me. I mean, I should probably, I should probably get a hype house out here in LA. <laughs> I could be your hype man. Oh, this not gap. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was a fun dinner and I was glad I was, I, I could meet you in, in person for the first time. Cause I was, I was a big fan of, uh, of what you were doing. Um, but the reason I bring it up is so, you know, Peter Kaufman, which, I, he gave me permission to do a write up about like spending a day with him, which I still need to write out. It's in my draft folder. But one of his things is he likes to hand out pens to people, and the pen like basically has this quote. I actually have the pen because I, I take notes with it right here, and basically says, you know, most geniuses, especially those who lead others, prosper not by deconstructing intricate complexities, but by exploiting unrecognized simplicities. Right. Hmm. I like that Kaufman saying. Yeah, that's a heck of yeah. a quote to put on a pen. 
That's uh, yeah. Peter Kaufman is a smart dude, man. He's a good guy. He's a too. smart, smart dude. I really enjoyed my day with him for sure, which was a surprise unto itself. I thought we'd have lunch, which was actually through like a Twitter like invite of of all things. So you know, well, I think you've talked. You know, Rishi. Rishi is amazing too, and and he uh yeah he uh he yeah, he, he uh he said if I wanted to go, I was like sure, why not? And it turned into this amazing experience. But corporate governance in the context of investing for me. And, and I think this can very much be for, for any investor that spends time in it, is basically exploiting unrecognized simplicities. It really is. There's some very simple concepts in corporate governance that you can exploit that never really gets properly priced into stocks. Now, you can say eventually the pod shops and, and Rentech will eventually you know arbitrage all of this. But on the other hand, this isn't really a strategy that, that scales for the, for the machines necessarily. And so there are these opportunities, you know, as an investor on names that you're already familiar with, where if you just follow the corporate governance side of things and, and you notice an inflective change in, in how they're doing certain things, that could be a very important signal for you as, as an investor. So this is an opportunity for you to, you know, exploit unrecognized simplicities hiding in the proxy statements. I think that tends to resonate with a lot of folks I talk to where it's like, this isn't like rocket science this isn't hard stuff a lot of things i write about should feel kind of like you read my stuff enough it'll probably feel like hindsight analysis or like this is dumb but like i don't know the stock just doesn't price this outcome in so check it out guys you'll really be able to to see that play out yeah i mean i don't i want to make sure that you're not selling yourself short here i think that you have identified i mean you mentioned before Greenblatt, right? You've identified a unique way to ferret out special situations, and it's it's something that not many people are taught, and that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure half the subscribers think I'm Nostradamus, and, and then the other half are just like, I don't know what is going on here. This seems pretty obvious, but you're right; it's not priced in, but. I don't. It, we we have fun in the premium. It's. I personally think, and I'm biased, obviously. I actually think the premium content is orders of magnitude better than the free write ups, partly because I get to share real time situations and it's fun. It's a puzzle, right? Yeah. Well, that's how it's yeah. supposed to be. Right? Well, it's how it's supposed to be. But like, really, orders of magnitude better. There's something to be said about like playing the game in real time and writing about stuff in real time, and really just like working those analytical muscles and seeing that that play out that you can't really like appreciate when you're doing a retrospective write-up but yes to your point the premium should be orders of magnitude better but like it's really much better <laughs> for the, for what the for what the non-gap does yeah everybody should pay for the premium and by the way this episode is sponsored by non-gap <laughs> <laughs> you're two dollars yeah, two dollars you a lot of uh, a lot of luck Right yeah, and, and I appreciate you know the support uh, that, that you and Tobias. I mean, Tobias was the first person that asked me to go on to a podcast. Which, I mean, at the time, I was like, "You want to talk to me?" Like, what? what speaking of like kind of the the, the one man journey and just kind of hanging on, going like, "Oh, you want to talk to me?" So it's you know, forever appreciative of, of you guys supporting the the newsletter and making me feel like a celebrity every now and then and, and, and the the two dollars and 79 cent check is is in the mail for sure. thank you uh you make it easy to to do man i have no problem supporting you so what do you see going on right now in the market i mean do you believe in all this gamma squeeze stuff and these yolo retail guys like what the hell is happening in gamestop and for those that don't know, we're recording on January 15th, just in case this gets a little dated. So I find this goes back to like thinking about investing and, and kind of how I look at investing. And, and I invest more often than not into communities and networked assets and, and things of that sort, marketplaces. And so Wall Street bets is kind of this just crazy world where it's just fascinating to follow. Like speaking of like kind of power to the people and like, I, you know, I don't know how much of a role or impact they truly are, or, or if it's just kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where they talk about it and then, you know, a bunch of machines and investor, you know, actual professional investors you know, play into that narrative and, and it all self-fulfills. But 
it, it does kind of go into the whole notion of like narratives and narrative investing and you know how as an activist investor you know, we it was very much a tentpole concept you know fixing your communication inserting your narrative into the stock price like that's something like the big boys have been doing for a long time i mean like you think about was it 2008 you know the the famous porsche short squeeze and volkswagen right and how that happened you know fast forward 10 years now it's the people that can pull it off apparently which is like it's like amazing kind of yeah. fe- it feeds into this whole internet technology trend where like one person can build a living well i guess one post on wall street bets can build a massive short squeeze you know what a time to be alive you know what a time to think about the power of the internet to mobilize you know one voice to to do stuff so i you know i always look at it these situations from like yeah there is some you know yolo crazy you know scenarios playing out but is it that much crazier than like some of the narratives and yolo games that you know the institutional players have played you know in the past maybe not as kind of degenerate as i mean they call themselves degenerates on wall street bets but it's definitely a fascinating thing and i so i did a tweet the other day where i'm like okay this this is insane. There's there's a YOLO outcome really playing out here right now. But like, it kind of reminded me of Tesla a few years ago in the sense of like, what if everyone here on Wall Street Bets just decides, you know what, we actually, whether it's for meme purposes or they actually believe in it, we, we want to play into the narrative that GameStop is going to attempt to be the Amazon of, of gaming or, or whatever it may be. And And you stop and think like, Amazon is this like unstoppable force right? Like, you just can't really beat them in the traditional sense, right? They'll, they'll undercut you, they'll undercut you on pricing, they'll, they're a vicious competitor, a vicious operator. So how, how do you beat someone like that? And I think, you know, when you think about like Shopify, and their theme of like arming the rebels to kind of like, you know, do this sort of uh, combat against Amazon, as far as e-commerce, I'm just like, you know what, like, Whoever beats Amazon, it's probably going to look a lot like how Elon built Tesla to take on, you know, certain industries. It's going to be like a cult of personality founder with a rabid base that has a certain level of uh, price insensitivity that just kind of almost wills certain things into existence and and are willing to back things because they just believe in it, right? It's kind of the whole like cult formation that helps cross the chasm right and then you cross to the other side and suddenly you you know you're like tesla you're 600 plus billion dollar you know market cap and yeah you can slash this thing by 75 percent but you know what issuing equity at 75 percent pretty much locks in whatever runway elon needs for the next few decades to to do whatever vision he needs to do for all we know that could happen here or, or somewhere else where it's like if you're jeff bezos i'm not afraid of you know a visionary operator or someone trying to build a Zappos or diapers or Walmart. I, I'm definitely afraid of the cult and they believe. That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of that cult's personality where it's like, this dude just went full, you know, yeah. with a Cohen. He like, people always joke like he probably would be richer if he just held on to his Chewy stock instead of like going all in. I think he went like Apple, Wells Fargo, and now GameStop. But I'm all like, this dude just went, he's a founder, he's done this before. Like it, the narrative almost like mirrors Elon, right? He, Elon exits PayPal. He has all this cash. He just plows it into SpaceX and Tesla. Pretty sure he's pretty much living on people's couches and borrowing money for his day to day. Like this dude plows his Chewy games into this GameStop thing. He truly believes in this like audacious, huge vision that, oh, by the way, is a narrative that he can talk about for decades and has a massive TAM which means he'll never have that restriction as far as like, you know, the numbers start, like you run into TAM issues or like, oh yeah, the narrative's done, the story's done. Like, no, his North Star is decades out. His TAM is massive. You have him who's all in. All you need to do is evangelize those first early adopters that then brings on the rest of your tribe. And now you have this cult that just believes potentially and starts willing things into existence because maybe they do love GameStop. Maybe they do love like their local you know, being able to go into a store and then like go like, you know what? I don't want to buy my stuff from Amazon. I want to be a part of like a movement. I'm a part of a movement now. I can take on Amazon for this particular vertical or category. It's actually bigger than me. This isn't just about video games. This is now about taking on the monolith that's, you know, winning 
that's taking over, you know, yeah. every city, you know, with Prime. Like it becomes a much bigger thing to to buy into. So like if I'm Jeff Bezos, I'm not afraid of operators or, or superior unit economics or someone else. I'm afraid of of the cult that wills an idea across the chasm in some insane fashion and just get scale and suddenly actually oh boy we have a problem here boys in in the same ways that elon did it to the auto industry and oh by the way being the amazon of gaming that sort of narrative that story that disruptive like story can you imagine if like kathy and arc you know embraced and bought into that narrative that digital transformation at gamestop go you know what we we buy into this transformation y'all Y'all, this could get pretty like crazy. <laughs> this this could get real crazy. Yeah, but man. I and love... then you get the flows into Ark, and then Orcs pouring it into yeah. GameStop, and then you get the cult of personality. Yeah. That would be nuts. And yeah. the thing that I think that people discount too much is how real that is now. And maybe it's always been real, but it's like it's no longer concentrated in a few people, right? It's super distributed. And I think it can happen almost anywhere. I mean, it's bizarre because not anyone can pull it off. You need to have some sort of attention aggregation. But I do believe that you can sort of see a bubble forming a little bit. And if you just discount it, that can be a very, very potentially harmful thing to do. I think it plays into a lot of themes that we talked about, just even like with like Substack and like your journey and my journey, where it's, you know, people rally around individuals but they also rally around ideas right and and they value that sort of perspectives i always joke like you know the old way of thinking is you need money to drive change to change the world it's like yeah that that makes it very easy but it's almost the old school way of thinking things i i actually say like you don't really need money to change the world like objectively speaking i think non-gap the newsletter could probably cause all kinds of mayhem if I wanted to on, on certain governance topics. Right. I think there's enough, there's enough community support. And I think FinTwit would just do it for the, the lulls to be honest, but I really do think we could probably put on a gadfly campaign around some topic or issue where like literally we don't own that much stock individually, but we could probably do a lot with it. And it is partly, yes, like I know the traditional levers to drive change as an activist. People have to believe that you're capable of doing it, but the internet has made it possible to form these, these tribes, these cults, these enthusiastic uh, contributors to drive change. And I know we talked about this uh, as far as like influencing in tech, despite having dual class shares, the most powerful things around governance and advocacy and, and driving change hasn't come from shareholders in tech. More often than not, it came from a medium post from an ex-employee, right? That laid out some very important criticisms that were ignored because when, when you're on the rocket ship, people tolerate all sorts of monstrous and egregious behavior that you shouldn't really be tolerating. Those medium posts then rally other folks that recognize, hey, I went through these sort of issues too, myself. This is not acceptable. And now you create you create this coalition to drive change. And so, you know, going back to Wall Street Bets, like when you think about these kind of crazy outcomes, these crazy YOLOs, I'm just like, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. What a time to be alive. But oh boy, what if, what if this is just the tip of the iceberg of how you actually like compete and, and take on the 800 pound gorilla? It certainly isn't just starting a business. Like the scariest competitors in the marketplace right now aren't companies, they're individuals. They rally their tribe, you know, whether it's GameStop being you know, an example or Elon Musk or, you know, Mr. Beast, you know, rallying his YouTube followers or someone else to to start a business or, or Dave Portnoy rallying you know, his users to raise money for restaurants. There is something happening out there that's fascinating that that's going to give a lot of people different opportunities to enrich their own lives, hopefully one day, but also like. The rules of the game are changing in real time, and, and a lot of companies don't really appreciate what this may mean over the next five to ten years. And I don't think GameStop is a one-off incident. We're, we're going to potentially see more and more of this sort of outcomes, but maybe it's, you know, hopefully it's more rational. But who knows? I mean, it's going to be you know, a ride, I think, as an investor. And there will be a windows of opportunity to potentially get involved 
on a risk adjusted basis for everyone figures it out. I, so at some point, I have a write up like lined up about this between narrative investing, writing cults, windows of opportunity tied to you know micro strategy and kind of the whole that whole transition of being this kind of dead money legacy you know business intelligence software player and and that's the sequence of events that turned it into arguably this kind of bitcoin dollar darling and actually if you were paying attention there was an uh, there was an opportunity to buy into this narrative this story before it was even priced into the stock even though management literally said we are buying we're going to spend 250 million dollars or, or I, I think they literally said 250 million dollars into alternative currencies. Literally, they were saying we're going to go into Bitcoin and the stock didn't really react all that much to that information. And we know that like that was that I knew that was a narrative shift that was going to happen like right off the bat. I mean, I it was a very like speculative position for me, but like I bought into it. I think I bought into that like 130 bucks or whatever. I forgot what, what price I bought it, but it was definitely like pre-Bitcoin. I'm not about to say I, I, I predicted 600 bucks, but you certainly could have recognized that shift. And it kind of plays into a lot of themes that are driving the GameStop story, that has driven the Tesla story, that drives why Dave Portnoy can raise money, why Mr. Beast can you know, do a pop-up you know, burger shop to great success. Like These are things that are going to happen more often. And we're actually still very early. And, and I'm not sure investors are fully comprehending what this means potentially for their portfolios and their positions, both upside and downside. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I've been really grateful to be able to follow you and talk to you and like fool all the time as a guy that pushes my mind, you know, really to think about what's going on on the Internet and culture and, you know, within influencers and whatnot. The other thing that's been helpful to me is being in the center of some of that. I mean, I realize the power of having a base that believes in you at the right time. I don't know. It's it's really wild. It's going to be interesting to watch going forward. Man, I got to wrap up because uh, I actually got to go get the kids from school, which is a shame. But I have enjoyed speaking with you, and I could do it over and over again or go longer. So I hope that you'll come back on when you got something to say. And in the meantime... Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Indeed, man. I really like what you're doing, so uh, please keep in touch. Yeah, well, hopefully you get something out of that chat. It was just fun talking about this stuff. I got a lot out of the chat. Hopefully somebody else got something, too. <laughs> you know, it, well, I, I'll let you go get your kids, but like this conversation pretty much, I think, captures speaking of mule, like what I find fun, right? Like It's a barbell. Like I love the memes. I love kind of the community and cults and, and the trends on one end of the barbell and then on the other end it's literally like stodgy corporate governance and compensation and somehow and and but somehow narrative fits into both of them and it all kind of you know it, it makes sense to me so i dig man it makes sense to me too all right i gotta go so we'll talk soon take care